Good morning. My name is Vanessa Storelinowski, Projects and Research Director here at the Inter-American Conference on Social Security. On behalf of our president, Mr. Zoe Robledo Aburto, and our secretary in general, Mr. Adal Velar Hernandez, I am pleased to welcome you all to the 31st session of the Permanent Seminar on Welfare in the Americas. This time, it is entitled, Is Social Protection to Blame for Informality? New Evidence and Reflections on Inclusive, Adequate, and Fair Social Protection Systems. We are joined by our distinguished guests, Florian Jurgens Grant, Social Protection Specialist at Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, Diego, a global network dedicated to improving the working conditions of working people, especially women, living in poverty and informal economy to secure their livelihood. We're also joined by our most estimated colleague, Mr. Miguel Angel Ramirez Villela, who will guide our dialogue with Mr. Jurgen Grant this morning. I hereby thank you all for your attention and our distinguished guests for their participation, which I am sure will be of the utmost interest for all of us. Welcome and please take a seat. Thank you, Vanessa, for giving me the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining, uh, for joining us in this session of our permanent seminar, uh, of our permanent seminar on welfare in the Americas. We are very excited because of the theme we will discuss today. Uh, it's been 12 years since Santiago Levy's book, Good Intentions, Bad Outcomes, was published, but his, uh, his ideas continue to strongly influence social security debates today especially in Mexico and Latin America. Unfortunately, the ideas that analysts and officials have rescued are more those that indicate that non-contributory programs encourage informality, and not so much those that call, that call for the creation of a broad benefit system to grant minimum protections to the entire population. Today, when someone presents a proposal to create as some new benefit, one of the first objections raised is whether it, no, it would not create more informality. In general, this idea that contributory, non-contributory programs encourage informality was adopted quickly and non-critically. It has been almost a dogma and very few people have dared to question it. This is why, this is why we are so, so excited about today's presentation. Mm -hmm. Today, Florian will talk, uh, talk to us about the project that he coordinates at uh, Women in Informal Economy, in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, and that precisely, precisely and he precisely questions the, levy, the, the, the Levy's argument. As Vanessa said, Florian is a social protection specialist working in Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, that is a network dedicated to improving the working conditions of working people, living in poverty in the informal economy to secure their li livelihoods. He focuses on the design, implementation, and evaluation of social protection policies and programs. Before joining WIGO, Florian worked on social protection at HealthAge International and the ILO, International Labor Organization. Uh, Florian will talk us uh, for up to 40 minutes. And after that, we will have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Florian, the floor is all of yours. Thank you so much, Miguel and Vanessa. And um, thanks for all involved in, in uh, putting this together. And thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's really exciting for me to talk about these issues. And I'm really excited to hear that these are issues that you're grappling with um, and have been for a long time. Um, and uh, it's something that WIGO has, has cared about for a long time, but over the last year or so, we've had some resources to really, really look into it critically and really do some research on it. Um, and I want to show with you show you some of those um, findings. Um, you are, um, I think, the first people to really um, see the, the, the kind of outcomes of this, um, this research project that we have around um, uh, that has an element to focus on these kind of incentives. Um, so this is the first presentation that um, I'm really giving on this, where I'm trying to bring all the elements together. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll see how it goes. Um, also, just to say that I'm, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, 
lots of those, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of argument emerges from, from Mexico in 2008 and has been in particularly, I think, relevant for, for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, Caribbean. But um, just to say that I'm not a, you know, regional expert um, and um, I, I'm working with a, with a set of um, brilliant researchers and colleagues um, across the world, but particularly in Latin America, uh, who have, you know, done a lot of the research and thinking and I'm just kind of bringing it together at this stage. Um, so anyway, with all of that, uh, let me get started. And maybe just to say to Miguel and Vanessa that I, when I'm presenting, I can't see the chat. So if you want to, you know, get my attention, just just shout, just let me know. Okay, so is social protection to blame for informality? Um, and as Miguel said, I want to talk to you about some new inf evidence that we've developed. Think a little bit about what that might mean if we were to accept the argument that social protection is to blame for informality. Um, what kind of social protection systems might emerge from that idea? Um, and what we might want to do to critically engage with this, this argument a little bit more. And maybe what uh, those of us, and I think I'm including a lot of you here who care about um, social security, um, you know, how we can respond to that, that challenge. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, I will talk, talk a little bit about social protection informal workers, the relationship between social protection and informality. As I said, we'll have this really exciting new evidence that is not yet published, but will hopefully very soon, but that I'm sharing with you already. Um, again, as I said, think about the consequences of accepting these claims, you know, what might they mean for, I think, the shared objective of expanding social protection. So I think while there's a lot of disagreement maybe in the sector, um, and, you know, different agencies have different visions on what social protection should look like in the future. I think there is a probably a shared sense that we do need more of it, um, of social protection, particularly coming out of COVID. Um, so, but, you know, they will, those systems will look very differently and there will be, in a way, different winners and losers, I think. Um, so I want to talk about that. And then, as important... Think of all this, you know, the presentation, uh, the research that we're presenting, and you know how we can maybe work together further to explore these issues a little bit more. Um, so, just quickly, an introduction to informality and informal workers. A lot of you might know all of this, uh, but I, you know, it's good to start with that. Um, so, you know, informality is not a small subset of the, the you know, the kind of economically active population. In fact, 60% uh, of all working people, 2 billion people globally, 70% in low and middle income countries work in the informal economy. Um, on the side here, you see some regional um, breakdowns and by income level. Um, and obviously it varies quite a lot, but I think it's important to note that, you know, informality is everywhere in all regions at all income levels to different degrees and, you know, different countries and regions have different labor markets, of course, um, but, you know, it is, it is an issue that exists um, throughout. Um, and, you know, without getting too technical about definitions, you know, the, the general idea of an informal worker is someone, you know, who lacks um, labor, labor and social protections, uh, you know, which we know are so important to, to smooth uh, consumption across the life course, protect against risk, um, keep people out of poverty. Um, you know, with COVID, we've, again, you know, really seen the importance of, of social protection. Um, and, you know, this is generally speaking a group of people who lacks access to social protection for a number of reasons. Um, they're not all poor. Um, you know, they, they are some non-poor uh, informal workers. Um, but on the whole, on average, uh, the risk of poverty is higher in the informal economy. And that has to do with a number of reasons. And one of them is the lack of social protection, I think, that, you know, stops people from, uh, you know, from, from kind of effectively managing risks and investing in their future and their businesses. Um, it's also highly gendered, the informal economy, um, and women tend to be kind of segregated in the more vulnerable occupations. On the left side here, you see the kind of Uyghurs informal uh, economy pyramid. Employers on top, mainly men, and then there is kind of a, a, a downward development of uh, of lower earnings and higher risks of poverty and different types of informal workers kind of largely cluster in different segments of the informal economy. Informal workers generally are being left out of social protection um, because they are 
you know, excluded from employment linked to social insurance as informal workers, but also often the poverty targeted schemes that are designed for the most destitute don't reach um, informal workers uh, because they're, you know, while not rich and while of, often facing a lot, you know, a good amount of economic hardship and, and poverty, they are often not amongst the most destitute. And so they're excluded from social assistance at times as well. Um, just uh, to say, I think over the last couple of years with the SDGs, with the COVID crisis, the idea of universal social protection has really gained, um, gained ground, you know, um, and the uh, social protection floors concept of the ILO, of the, of the UN, and the you know, universal social protection framework, they provide principles and actions for what that might look like. And, um, you know, at the same time, though, we see at the bottom here, and there's some graphs that, you know, there's still huge social protection gap, right? So millions of people um, around the world, um, you know, in diff different regions lack social protection, despite this growing consensus that we really need to make sure that universal social protection can be realized. Um, so, and I think now we get to the heart of it. And I think the, the question that we go asked itself, ourselves, um, it, you know, is like, why are we not making enough progress? What is holding us back? You know, everybody talks about universal social protection, even agencies like, say, the World Bank, who I personally think previously have been more, uh, you know, kind of ha had a view of social protection that was more limited and a focus on safety nets and kind of poverty targeting and, uh, you know, kind of cash transfers. You know, they are now talking about universal social protection, their new social protection strategies completely framed around it. Uh, civil society is on board. The UN is on board. Um, so there is lots of support everybody talks about it so the idea that we go uh, my colleagues have there was before i've joined have come up with that you know it's the there, there, there are certain ideas um behind the scene they're not often acknowledged um and they uh, they they hold back the realization of universal protection um and they provide the, let's say, the, the, the foundation for principles of, of universal social protection, USP, being challenged, particularly, I think, by international financial institutions. I still think World Bank and IMF uh, play a large role in that, um, but also at the national level when it comes to you know, the design of schemes. Um, and the, a, key, a key barrier, I'm not saying it's the most important one, but it's a very interesting one um, that we're going to focus on today, is the idea that social protection systems cause substantive increases in informality. Um, and the argument you know, goes like this. And I think you, sorry, I actually don't know who I'm talking to. I, I, it could be that you're all very familiar with these arguments, um, but let me just state it. Um, social protection systems that combine employment-linked social insurance, so contributory social insurance, social security, with tax-financed social assistance, non-contributory schemes um, for low-income workers, um, informal workers, they create informality. Um, so we call this the perverse incentives thesis, the PIT for short. Um, and it, it, it has two elements to it. On the one hand, the social protection generates informality and then informality leads to low productivity and growth. So there's just two, two sides to it. Um, just, just you know, kind of having it try to articulate it maybe a little bit more, more clearly that proponents of this thesis, um, and by the way, if I'm going too, too quickly, you know, just shout, um, but I, I just want to get through the stuff that I think you might be quite familiar with. Um, so the proponents of the PIT, they argue that um, social security finance through payroll contributions. Um, so this is contributions linked to employment. You know, you, you pay your, I don't know, 7%, your employer pays your 7%, but it's linked to formal employment. Um, and because it is linked to formal employment and because employers contribute to it, it is increases, they say, the cost of formal labor, right? So formal labor gets more expensive because there's this additional, these additional contributions that need to be made. Um, and because there's a, there's a point here that because workers don't fully appreciate the benefit that is generated or that is bought with these contributions, they see it as a, as a cost rather than as a deferred kind of benefit that they will access to in the future, deferred compensation. But anyway, uh, payroll contributions make formal employment more expensive. Um, and at the same time, because we're now providing tax finance, non-contributory social assistance to informal workers, uh, so they get something for free in a way without contributing. 
um, that makes informal, that subsidizes informal work. So the, you know, while there might have been here in terms of kind of costs and, uh, or, you know, there might've been differences, but the difference increases. Um, one gets more expensive, the other one gets relatively cheaper. Um, and the argument is that this difference uh, provides an argument incentive for employers, for firms to evade relevant labor uh, and security laws and essentially create informal employment. Um, the, the, there's a flip side to that as well, that informal workers who, before the introduction of non-contributory social assistance, needed to work formally in order to get healthcare and other, you know, pensions, all kinds of social security benefits, now they can access those even though they remain or become informal workers, right? Um, so the argument is it makes them more inclined to accept informal employment, um, and maybe not seek out formal employment. Um, uh, and this you know, is, is same for self-employed workers who might, according to this argument, choose to re reduce taxes and contributions while now still being able to access benefits. Um, so that's the, the idea. And I think you know, whether we think it's, it's right or wrong, um, it is, a, I think, a kind of simple and coherent idea that is intuitive you know, at, at a level. And I think that explains the the kind of popularity of, of the argument, um, you know. Um, but anyway, it's not that easy. Um, so uh, who promotes this, this pit, the argument? You've mentioned Santiago Levy's uh, really influential book, Good Intention, Bad Outcomes, Social Policy, Informality and Economic Growth in Mexico, which came out in 2008. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a long book. Um, and, you know, there's a lot in there, but the, I've pulled out some quotes here. And it says it quite clear um, that, you know, it's the differences between the benefits, sorry, uh, you know, that the, the, nat the nature of benefits and financing, social protection and social security. When he means social protection, he means social assistance programs. So tax finance, social, social assistance. Um, and they uh, create a subsidy, uh, a tax on salaried labor and a subsidy on non-salaried labor. Um, it, what is interesting, and I don't know why, I feel like, oh, so this argument was made in 2008, and then we've done um, some literature um, analysis recently that I'll present to you. I feel like there was a silence for about, you know, eight, eight, I don't know, six, six years or so. And then recently, there's been a resurgence of this argument, which is one reason why we're, we're I think, um, doing this research and having this conversation. Um, and that's so recently it's been seems to have been picked up again, um, particularly by the IMF, the World Bank, UNDP. Um, they've issued some pretty high profile reports recently on um, informal economy. Um, and, you know, they, they make it quite clear that they buy into this argument. Um, so here UNDP, social protection policies contribute to informality, uh, social protection policies, tax formality and subsidized informality. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's there, it's quite clear. Um, I don't know what, why this is, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. My sense is that maybe following COVID, there's been increased attention to the informal economy. And that as people have started to think about it again, they've kind of gone back to um, maybe some of the earlier arguments made by Levy and others. Um, but anyway, I think the point is that it wasn't just, it's not, we're not just kind of engaging with an argument made uh, what like, um, you know, uh, two decades ago. But it is quite current, and you know, as Miguel said, it's very much, um, you know, it's very much at the forefront of discussions uh, in some circles on informality. Um, so, and you know, uh, why why does this why does it all matter, right? Um, and I actually think that sometimes is a good point because I'll get to that in a minute later. If you look at some of the impacts, uh, sorry, the the impacts that are being reported by studies that focus on the incentive thesis, they're not very big. You know, sometimes we talk about subgroups or a few percentage points here. I, I, it's, sometimes I wonder why is this such a big focus, you know? Um, we're really not talking about, you know, massive impacts, I think, even those who claim that they are, they're quite marginal at times. Um, so why does it matter for them, for those who make that argument? Why does it matter for us to respond to it? Um, and here's my, my attempt to, to respond to that. Um, so I, I think that th there's so many different ways to design social protection systems in line with different uh, income levels, uh, economic structures, different values and priorities. There's lots of, lots of difference, right? Um, but I do think 
social protection systems, if they're going to be comprehensive, they're going to be universal, and if they're going to speak to different objectives of social protection, they will always have to be mixed systems in one way or another, right? Um, so the objectives of social protection to protect people against poverty require or you know requires some uh, kind of generalized contributions um some maybe uh you know tax financing some people just don't have enough money and you know can't finance it themselves so we need to have some redistribution there consumption smoothing on the other hand is about maintaining your own income into the future and kind of averaging it out over a lifetime that requires some kind of link to your your living standards your earnings um insurance is you know it's not something you can achieve on your own um so you know there's different objectives we always we'll always need a mix of schemes financed through different mechanisms um so we're not getting around um the issue of mixed systems and what incentives they might create for people trying to navigate them um at the same time, I also don't think we're really getting rid of um, informality anytime soon. You've seen the the, the figures early on, um, and you know, and you can even talk about maybe some more recent changes to labor markets, the gig economy. You know, so so, so these these issues are, are with us um, for for the for the foreseeable future. Um, so systems will always be mixed, I think. Um, and to expand coverage, we need universal, effective, and you know, and I think it's important when we talk about universal social protection, we don't just mean, or at least I don't just mean, give everybody $10 and be done with it, right? So, you know, there, there's different, universal can mean very different things. So it could just give everybody, you know, you know, it could be UBI, that could be universal social protection, I guess. What I'm talking about is, is a, I guess, a system of social protection mechanisms that respond to different needs, different risks, different kind of poverty profiles. Um, and for that system, I think we will need more social assistance, tax financed, um, because we need a basic level of protection for everybody, regardless of whether they're informal workers, informal workers, whether they're not a worker at all, not, not everybody is a worker. And, and what do we even mean by work? You know, maybe we need to redefine that as well. Um, so that's a given. And I think there's a lot of attention on that. We need more social assistance. I think more needs to be done with that. Um, but I think we also need more social insurance. Um, you know, as I said, because we do need to respond to these objectives around insurance and consumption, consumption smoothing that are not well responded to by flat tax finance benefits. Um, um, and, you know, so I think we, we social insurance is really important. And I think that's where really the conversation then is um, where the pit, I think, challenges the relevance of social insurance going forward. Um, but um, I, I, and, I, and, and I think that's also why Uyghur is, is, is engaging with this because we do think social insurance is important, not least because social insurance tends to provide, we think, a better protection against work-related risks um, that, you know, um, um, yeah, that, that, that can't be done by, by simple kind of tax schemes as, as well. Um, um, and, and, you know, and, and in for many informal workers, as I said, not all of them are poor, Many of them are not rich. Many of them face hardships and find it may find it difficult to. Uh, we might not have the contributory capacities to pay into, um, you know, pay the full share of their social security, uh, social insurance premiums, um, especially because they don't have an employer who can also chip in. You know, it falls on their shoulders. So we believe that to re reach, you know, large scale coverage amongst informal workers. We need some form of subsidies or minimum income floors within social insurance system. Um, but if you follow the pit log logic, then even subsidization within social insurance creates the same incentive effects, right? Um, um, and uh, sorry, not subsidy. Yeah, and if if you for instance, if you subsidize informal workers' access to social insurance, that's again subsidizing informal employment. So we're we're kind of at the same challenge. Um, and let me just check the time. I think I'm okay. Um, but also, I think beyond social protection, sorry. Um, yes. So, you know, there's a risk that we would have if we accept the, the argument, uh, we will no longer have these subsidies for informal workers to join social insurance because it is, uh, again, a, a subsidy on informal employment and creates those incentive effects. Um, I think we also wouldn't be having as much social assistance to poor informal workers in mixed systems. This is all about mixed systems, which is most systems globally. Um, 
because you know again this is the the kind of the the, the issue right you give some you give a, a free benefit to poor informal workers so you make it more bearable or more maybe cost effective to work informally um so same issue um and this would get us to a system that is proposed by Santiago Levy, or I think by the World Bank now as well in their latest strategy that is mainly social assistance financed by consumption and maybe income taxes. Um, so tax financing funds a UBI or a more expanded social assistance. And then after that, it's private voluntary, you know, people are kind of on their own, find your own insurance, do it voluntary, we don't really care. Um, and I think that's that's the result maybe of taking the pitch very serious and we move towards that uh, shifting the burden from employers workers taxpayers to taxpayers and consumers losing the kind of contribution on from um, capital and employers in that process um, we would also lose the redistribution within social insurance if we move to entirely private voluntary schemes um, but also importantly we would lose a link between work and protection right if we de-link social insurance from work because it creates these distortions and just say pay your taxes we give you a ubi and now you do private insurance we lose i think the the relationship between the risks of working uh, work injury um, you know, unemployment, um, you know, not, not quite the same, but maternity benefits that are related to, to work, um, we, we lose those, those connections. So in a, in a nutshell, I think the pit argument can lead to universal social protection or to a form of universal protection that people might have. But I would question whether that provides, you know, adequate coverage um, and whether it's fairly financed. Um, right. Uh, also, more, more broadly speaking, um, it, it, it presents what's what we call a volunteer school of informality. People work voluntarily in the informal economy. They make a choice, a deliberate, rational choice. They weigh the cost and benefits. You know, they wake up in the morning, they compare two jobs and freely choose the one that provides the highest benefits at the lowest cost, right? Um, so it's a very rational choice, uh, you know, kind of... Um, explanation of informality and while that might be the case for some we feel that theory that underpins the, this pit argument ignores structural legal and social cultural barriers to formal employment um, sometimes there just aren't any formal jobs sometimes there's discrimination sometimes people don't may, may not have the uh, the legal rights or the uh, the required skills or credentials to work those um, and by focusing on these like marginal you know, impacts and incentives uh, for a few, and they might be the case for a few workers kind of at the, at the, the center of it, um, you know, um, at the margin of, let's say, you know, just between informality and informality, we do, th we do worry whether we're losing a focus on, um, on the real challenge, which is, you know, creating good jobs, creating decent work. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, um, and, 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 you know, I think, uh, it's not surprising, I think, that the argument is quite forcefully advanced from organizations that have pr previously of, or has often taken a critical view of lab labor regulation more broadly, right? Um, so, you know, thinking of kind of the World Bank maybe, um, and if social security contributions make formal work more expensive relative to, to informal work, I'm sure the same can be said about other forms of regulation, right? Uh, minimum wages, occupational safety and health, you know, they all or certainly occupational safety and health, they can provide costs to employers. Um, so if we accept the logic, you know, is, is there a risk that we, we continue expanding those and also start treating, uh, you know, kind of safe and um, safe working as a, as a, you know, as a distortion in the, the, the labor market. Um, so it provides, we think, potentially a rationale for wider deregulation of, of, of labor. But let me get to the, the evidence. Um, so with, with some colleagues, uh, and I'll show you the, the names and the, uh, the draft papers at the end, um, we've done a literature review on the evidence of the pit. Um, they found 27 academic articles, uh, reports, books. They're mainly from Latin America and the Caribbean, um, this, but it, it's, it seems to be uh, expanding. Um, so we also have studies from Thailand, from Turkey, um, 
but largely it seems to be a Latin American conversation at the moment. Um, and I think that makes sense to some extent because Latin America is a place that has, you know, a large informal economy, but also a large formal economy inherited a certain type of social protection system or, you know, maybe not inherited, but there is a presence of a large social security system. So it's kind of has a lot of large and relevant bits and pieces that are important for this argument. Um, so anyway, we found those 27 um, articles um, and 13 of those attempted to measure the impacts of different social protection programs on uh, various definitions of informality or formality. So some look at increases in informality, others look at decreases in formal employment. And, you know, they're like uh, the flip side of each other. Um, so we found about 13 papers. Um, many, fo most focus on health, some on cash transfers, some on taxes and subsidies for, um, uh, for informal workers to join social security schemes. Um, and then there's someone that just kind of look at the, you know, broader um, economic models and uh, models of the economy and, you know, trends and in development and try to see whether social protection, the introduction of social protection had any impacts on, um, on those trends. Um, so of those, uh, we worked with some, some uh, Mexican uh, economists um, who've helped us with this. We found about 11 have, you know, credible methodologies, um, you know, with proper kind of, you know, control groups and, you know, the, they're either RCTs or different kind of um, quasi-experimental um, uh, methods that can get us towards kind of causality. Um, and we find a mixed picture. So a slight majority, seven, find that there is a, find that social protection has led to an increase in informality or reductions in formality. So either more informal jobs or fewer formal jobs, which is kind of the same thing in a way. Um, what's interesting is that of those seven, four only find impacts for uh, subgroups. Um, so this could be uh, younger people, uh, older people, women, people in particular sectors uh, of particular skills. Um, so they don't find, you know, let's say a program is introduced in say Mexico as a whole, informality increases, they would find program being introduced for some workers in a certain country, informality has increased, you know, uh, so it's not, you know, it's not a total increase, but it's a subgroup increase. Um, and then we found four that um, find the opposite. Um, so essentially that either social protection actually increased formal jobs or uh, reduced informality. Um, so I would say the the, the SEMP, the evidence or the, the evidence base, first of all, isn't as substantive as I thought it was. You know, you uh, you look at those 27, you know, reports and you feel like, oh God, this is all overwhelming. But if you kind of look at them, you, you know, not all actually measure, try to measure stuff. Some just kind of speculate. Some we would argue don't have like the strongest methodologies or don't have great data. And then if you look at about the, the 10 or so that are pretty reasonable, um, you know, um, sound reports, uh, we find that it's not, maybe not 50-50, but it's certainly divided in terms of whether social protection has impacts on informality. Um, but this is what I'm most excited about. So back to the beginning, um, you know, you know, uh, I would imagine a lot of you know Seguro Popular. Um, and by the way, sorry, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm probably mispronouncing this. Um, you know, the, the healthcare program introduced in, uh, actually, I don't know, 2000, in the, the 2000s um, in Mexico to provide um, social protection, sorry, private health coverage to informal workers or workers not covered in the formal social security system. Um, and this is what Santiago Levy focused on in his uh, book. Um, um, so, and uh, so we felt that, and, and most of the studies actually try to look at this Corre Popular um, in, in one way or another. Um, and so we wanted to revisit that. We thought this is really influential. This is uh, clearly a key study. Well, let's maybe take another look. Um, and um, so, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, um, importantly, all the studies that I've just mentioned, they focus on surveys, um, small surveys, uh, looking at a subset of the population. Um, and, uh, but Mexico, I've been told, doesn't have a representative survey at the municipal level. So um, 
do, do, do. Yeah, so the, the most rigorous study that we could find, uh, this is Bosch and Campos Vasquez, um, 2014, they use administrative data from IMIS, the Mexican Social Security uh, Agency, you, you know better, um, to look at the impact. And this is what we thought is this is the most rigorous paper uh, using the best methods, the best data available. Um, and they find a small decrease in formal employment in small firms, about 17,000 jobs a year um, between 2000 and 2011. So they find an impact. Um, and we, we felt, look, this is the strongest paper. Let's take another look. Um, so we wanted to reevaluate it uh, because that's where it started. It's a large program. And we did that. And we worked with some you know, very um, highly credible, I think, economists. They took another look and they found that the evaluation by, what are their names again? Uh, Bosch and Campos Vasquez, um, which again, we felt was the strongest paper that is, was not robust, so it didn't hold. If we made a few changes to the uh, the econometric, um, you know, magic that I barely understand, um, so we included many more municipalities. We got really good data from um, IMIS. Um, they did some controlling for different time trends, um, newer advanced economic methods that I certainly don't understand. Um, we also used an instrumental variable strategy where we looked at lights from space um, and whether they are proxy and use them as a proxy for development um, and did some other stuff. And essentially any of those changes to the estimations made in 2014 by Bosch and Vasquez shows that social uh, sorry, security popular did not reduce the number of formal jobs. Um, it did not cause private sector workers to quit their jobs. And there's also no evidence of more limited supply of workers in the informal sector. So the wages in the formal sector did not increase. Um, so if fewer pe the, the idea is if many formal sector workers would have left the formal sector, um, they there would have been changes to the, the wages in that sector, but we don't observe any. So they conclude, and we will hopefully publish this in a couple of weeks or months, the most solid conclusion with the best available data and more robust methods is that Secure Popular did not increase did not decrease formal jobs in Mexico. So, uh, which I think is, is, is an important finding. Um, just to say, uh, we also looked at different subgroups, male, female, uh, permanent workers, rural, and essentially for none of the subgroups do we find a decrease in informal employment. Um, I am, uh, I'm skip that, um, I'm skipping that too. Um, so, now I want to leave space for discussion. Um, where, where does it leave us? Um, I think we need more research. We need more critical thinking and engagement to, to deal with this challenge, right? The pit is a challenge. Um, whether we think it's right or wrong or whether we, whatever we think of it, it, it poses a question to, to the way we design social protection system that maybe hasn't been answered fully. Um, I think we need also a better understanding of the benefits of social protection to informal workers um, and whether they outweigh any potential negative effects on, uh, on formalization, right? So I think the argument that the authors of the paper on Secure Popular made is like, look, uh, and this is the point here at the bottom, it's like, look, uh, Secure Popular gave healthcare to about 50 million Mexicans. Do we really care about 17,000 more people who might work informally? Like, you know, where's the, the, do we need to get a better sense of the, the proportions and the scale? Why are we focusing on this when there's, you know, when there's so much good that comes out of the social protection benefits? Um, but also like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to deny that there are incentive effects. I think incentives matter for some people. Maybe we need to understand better for whom and where and what might what might we be able to do to to address those right. Um, so we're not you know against it. I think the idea is that my general sense is it's kind of blown out of proportion. It's an issue maybe for some people. Some studies find it, others don't. But I don't think it's a reason for us to you know throw out social protection systems and rad like you know throw out the baby with the bathwater and get rid of social security. Um, and maybe just to say that what I call the, the Levy World Bank model of, um, let's say, safety nets plus private insurance um, is not the only path, right? There's plenty of examples in the region, particularly in Latin America, but also globally about more countries, um, you know, finding ways for social insurance 
to be more inclusive to informal workers. Um, so here's a just a quick graph I, I got from a paper on uh, Uruguay's monotributo scheme. And really you see here in 2008, there's a, there's a massive up 18, there's a huge uptick. So clearly we can, sometimes it's presented as a kind of a fait accompli, like we just can't get informal workers into the systems, but we can. And um, I think it's fine, you know? Um, so just to say, to conclude that we're also working with the, with the ILO right now on a study to think about good practices and lessons learned of expanding social insurance to self-employed workers. Because as I said, we've, we still feel that social insurance is really important. We feel it's important that it's publicly organized because it provide, can provide the protection, the risk pooling and the insurance that poor workers need. Um, so this is, uh, it's been my presentation. I hope I didn't go on for too long. Let me stop sharing. And I'm really excited to hear what you, yeah, what do you think of all of this? Um, as I said, this is the first time I'm trying to uh, put it all together. Um, let me try to close my presentation. So, yeah, I guess over to, um, is it Miguel or? Um... Thank you very much, Florian. Um, it was a great presentation and it's qu quite interesting. We are uh, discussing these topics here at the, at the room, but also we have some questions from the public and I will read it. Uh, the first is, so the evidence, the evidence is not conclusive. Don't you think it's a bit futile searching for evidence on two nearly excluding issues? In many countries, informality means out of social protection. Okay, so can you, can, you, can you say that one more time? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, don't you think it is a bit futile searching for evidence on two ne nearly excluding issues? In many countries, informality means out of social protection. Informality means. Um... Uh, I think this question refers to the to the issue that uh, in our countries, mainly in Latin America, in, uh, informality means out of social is being out of social protection. Mm. It's not being uh, protected by these systems. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is. Probably this is why it's why it's so important, right? And you know, the moment you propose any any efforts to bring people into social protection system, as you said, you're confronted with this argument. Um, oh yeah, that would be nice. That's it's good, but it would create these kind of economic problems. And um, so I think, and also I'm not sure whether, and obviously most informal workers are excluded from social protection. As I said that myself, but. Maybe we should stop saying that because there are lots of examples, uh, particularly in Latin America, with informal workers being integrated in um, in social security systems, right? So, and you mm -hmm. know, it's it's not it's not that they're categorically outside of them, um, and and maybe we need to be more confident in saying, yeah, it's fine, we can integrate them, and the world doesn't end, you know. Um, so maybe that's 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 an answer. Okay, um, well, th this, th this next one is, is of mine. And I would like to ask what are the next steps in this agenda? I, I think it's a, a, a very huge agenda and there are a lot of, topic, of topics to, to deal with, but wh wh what are the plans for, 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 your, for this project in the near future? It's a very good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I know. Um, I think we're still in a in a process of trying to understand it, um, and we so we've done these 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 pieces of research as a way to give give us and so we're we're a, a network of informal workers organizations, right? So we want the main goal of WeGo is to to empower or enable them to make make arguments for their inclusion into systems. Um, so I think what we want to do as a next step is to try to translate those. Um, those findings into uh, kind of materials and messages and workers' education that would enable, let's say, um, you know, uh, in, informal workers' associations in Mexico to say, next time they hear this argument, oh, it's going to lead to whatever, you know, the collapse of the formal economy. I think we want them to be able to say, you know, actually, no, it doesn't, and it's fine. And so it, we, we want to we work on the kind of the, the engagement advocacy. But I think... But I think we're also really, we, you know, we're really interested in hearing people's suggestions on what to do because we did these studies and, you know, they were scratching at the surface, I think. Um, so is the answer 
more studies like uh, we did it in Mexico where we're trying to challenge existing pieces um, um, or is this more about proving that informal workers can be included without the world ending I don't know I'm, I'm also interested in ideas but but for now we want to focus on communicating those those findings and enabling those who kind of engage on a day-to-day -day basis with um, with policymakers to be able to say to be able to share those findings okay uh, here we have another question uh, given that Latin America has uh, uh, has uh, uh, a highly unique societies. How can the sources of financing for social protection for social protection be diversified to create a new uh, vari a variety of contributory and non-contributory schemes that respond to the different realities of the population? It's a very good question. And again, I'm not an expert on on Latin America, um, but you know, um, uh, inequality is a huge problem, of course, uh, everywhere, and. Um, but inequality, I guess, also opens up maybe more opportunities to tax tax the rich. Um, uh, so that could be a possibility. But I think uh, the argument that I sometimes make is, look, if you so, as government support a, a broadening of social security, and if you help informal workers to contribute, they're not all poor, they have some ability to contribute. So you're bringing in fin financing into the social protection system that otherwise, you know, wouldn't be there. This might mean that governments need to provide some matching support or some subsidies, but you know you would still bring in a new you know a new group of people who can contribute to to the financing of social protection. Um, I think that's that's maybe an answer. Um, Another couple of questions are: the first one is, should we really include informal worker workers in social protection? And the second one is, what would be the dimensions, analytical dimensions or analysis variables to consider to build a better measurement of PIT? Um, I, yeah, we should include info workers in social protection. They're workers. Um, and, you know, even if they're not workers, everybody has the right to social protection. It's a human right. Um, so, yes, we should. And, you know, I think the good news is we can. It's been done and it is being done all over the place. We just need to learn from that. Better way to measure um, the purpose incentive thesis. Um, that is a very good question. And I think one of the challenges is that, so we go, what we always do is, you know, as an organization of workers, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of listening to informal workers, you know, hang out with them, um, hearing the stories. And, 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 and I think it's quite clear often when we talk to them that, you know, they work the jobs that they can, you know, it's not that they don't often have many choices in types of jobs that they could, could take on, right? So we have this kind of qualitative research, but then you have someone running a regression with some database and all of a sudden, you know, that kind of trumps the other, right? Um, so I think there's also a question on like what kind of evidence we, we, we listen to. Um, and um, I think there's a, yeah, certainly amongst the people who advocate for this, you know, there's, um, we, I think there's a, a reverence for these kind of econometric arguments that they look so, you know, you have all these Greek letters and it looks so serious and then you just believe that, you know, um, I think that's a problem. Um, how to be better measure it. But I think, so on the one hand, I think it's about insisting different kinds of information and listening to informal workers themselves and not just, you know, kind of um, just, you know, uh, econometricians econ 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 um but I also then i feel like if if they do it they at least do it do it well and you know for instance the some of the studies using very small small samples um there's sometimes issues with definitions um I'm not sure i can get into that um but i think we just need to take a much closer look at some of those reports and and also just sometimes at this so we often report that there's a statistically significant impact and then we're talking about like half a percentage point right so maybe it's also like an issue of like not just about measuring but also around like our own kind of literacy and ability to 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 call out nonsense when we see it um. okay, thank you florian this is another question in the case of mexico and other latin american countries what do you think would be the possible ways to the link health services from employment status in your opinion, what could be the financing schemes? And I would add, uh, is a desirable goal to the link health services from employment status? 
Uh, very, um, yeah, and, and I'm not a um, you know health health expert. Um, we have called it, but I think it, healthcare is actually a really good example where you probably don't want to link it to to employment. Um, I think you know, particularly looking at the United States as an example. I don't know, sorry if anyone's in a room of that being very suboptimal. Um, so I think, and this is kind of where the seductiveness of this argument of levy of delinking. You know, I think some forms of social protection can be delinked or shouldn't be linked to employment because. Um, you know, not everybody is a, is a worker. My previous organization, HelpAge, deals with older people. You know, they still need healthcare even though they're not employed. Um, so I, I think it's for us. It's about understanding why the justifications of linking. And I think for some parts of social protection, going to the objectives of social protection, insurance, poverty prevention, redistribution. Uh, you know, I think it makes sense to link to 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 work. It doesn't have to be a particular job, maybe, but to work more broadly or to, inc you know, income generated. So that makes sense. But I think work also creates risks, you know, and, I've, you know, employment injury, um, uh, maybe unemployment. Uh, sorry. You know, so there makes sense to link those those responses to risk being generated. Uh, but healthcare, I think, probably should be financed differently. Or maybe you can still have... Um, Maybe former workers can still contribute through their employment, um, but you know, obviously, we sh usage shouldn't be based on the financing, but rather on on need and um, uh, kind of rights. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. We here have uh, some more questions, but I think we don't have time to to deal with them. I I, I would like to ask some uh, uh, to. To, to dedicate this last minutes to, to, to this question. Um, some months ago, I, I heard this podcast from you, the um, Challenging global, global Social Protection Orthodoxies, and it was very appealing. And I would like to ask uh, how this uh, particular project uh, relates with these other orthodoxies that to, you talked about, mm. and what is the, the Uyghur's work in the near future about these orthodoxies? Thanks. Um, so there's, yeah, there's three, three ideas that we think are undermining universal social protection. One is what I talked about, the incentive issue. The other one is, the, is an issue um, that we still think of social protection not as an investment. You know, it's still seen, I think, by some people, despite all the research, as kind of a nice to have, um, you know, consumption. So we, we're doing some research to show what is the economic growth and development that countries are losing by not investing in informal workers? Um, and it comes kind of out of the COVID recovery. So we're doing um, a study that shows, look, if you invest money to informal workers, they will be more productive, they will be healthier, they will, um, you know, can maybe mitigate risks more and will contribute more to, um, to, to, to economic growth. Um, so that's the that's that's one, and we all have like pieces of research uh, coming out. So um, I maybe we'll, I hope we can just kind of stay in touch, and maybe I can share them as we as we go along. The third one is quite interesting. It's and it relates to this one is this idea that there's no employers in the informal economy, or you know, social security financing usually it's half employer, half worker. And the challenge in expanding informal uh, social insurance to informal workers is that. They have to pay it themselves, right? There's no one who pay the other, pays the other share. Um, and that's really hard, right? I mean, it's very difficult to pay. It's okay to pay, you know, I don't know, 10%, but not 25%. You know, it's, it's, it's different. Um, so we're trying to think about, but at the same time, we realize that lots of informal workers are part of value chains, economic chains, where firms benefit from their labor. Um, so the example is that we often use is India where uh, they have these welfare boards where all um, workers, construction workers, for instance, they are registered and then in, in, as construction workers. And then the firm on top of the pile, the, the, mo the, the making all the, you know, benefiting from the labor of, of informal workers, they pay a certain percentage to the social protection of those informal workers, even though they're not technically speaking their employer, right? They're just the the firm benefiting from their labor in a way. Um, so we're doing some case studies, um, one in Argentina where uh, waste pickers are trying to use um, these uh, extended producer responsibility framework, which is around plastic recycling, where they say, okay, 
uh, we're doing the job for those polluting companies. You know, we're cleaning up the, the cities and we do, we, we do, we essentially provide a service to, to those um, global corporations. So we are not technically employed by them, but we, in a way we work for them or we, we, we create value for them. Could we not find a way where they contribute to social protect to our social protection? Um, so the general idea is, is there other examples for firms that benefit from the labor of informal workers, but don't technically employ them to contribute to their to some kind of social security fund for informal workers? Um, it's a very new uh, new idea. We don't really know. We're just interested in exploring it because this this challenge of not you know, being dependent or being in value chains, but not technically have an employer because you're like a sub, 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 subcontracted worker, you know, that's a real, real problem. Um, so we, we're wondering whether some principles can be taken from that. Yeah. So we, we're trying to do, yeah, we're doing a bunch of research. It's kind of an intense year of research. And then next year we want to spend more time on communicating it, developing, uh, uh, you know, materials, engaging with people and, and also then trying to understand what the next steps might be. Okay, thank you very much, Florian. We would be very happy to know more about this, uh, these projects. And um, well, we have uh, some questions for Florian. We will send it to, to him. But uh, uh, before fin uh, finalizing this, this session, I would like to ask if you have any additional thoughts that you would like to add to um i am not sure I've, I've talked for an hour um i i don't know i um i'm i'm not sure <laughs> um i maybe just to say and i've like said this before we sometimes get i wonder why we're focused so much on these these tiny incentive impacts and i think maybe one of the message is maybe we just need to be more confident in saying they don't really matter that much you know like yeah we see we we even the the researchers um that we we worked with we we you know engaged them and and they looked at this and they were like well this doesn't matter this is like a percentage point like why are you paying us a lot of money to reevaluate this um when it's just not that important in the scheme of things you know they were saying the mexican economy has 20 million formal jobs and so what if you know fifteen thousand of those are no, now informal, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe we need a sense of proportion um, and what, what really matters. And what really matters is that, that people have access to social protection, everybody, so, you know, so. That's a great, a great final comment. Uh, <laughs> we are very grateful that you yeah. uh, share with us these, these findings. And we are very uh, pleased for all the people that joined this session of our seminar. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.